Hello everyone, and welcome to the Core Gaming Channel. Today we'll be reviewing the game Warhammer 40,000 Chaos Gate Demon Hunters. With the release of the console edition of Demon Hunters, as well as my personal completion of the campaign, both happening in February, I thought now would be a great time to give my thoughts on the game and address the question of whether or not it's still fun. So let's start with that. Is Warhammer 40,000 Chaos Gate Demon Hunters still worth playing in 2024? Answer, yes. Yes, it is. All right, that's it. Video done, you can leave now. Ah, uh, but why? All right, that's a good question. Why do I think that this is an incredible game which provides both satisfying lore-based storylines and an excellent gameplay loop? To explain that, I need to dig in a little bit. In Demon Hunters, you take control of the Grey Knight Strike Cruiser, the Baleful Edict. The intro shows your squad fighting against demons of corn, and after a Grey Knight Terminator literally impales a greater cornate demon prince. And you are now tasked with stopping the Nurgle Bloom in order to prevent galaxy-wide catastrophe. Pretty standard fare for a game in the Warhammer 40k universe, if you ask me. In any case, the Baleful Edict is your mobile command base, and starts off tattered and damaged from a years-long campaign against demonic forces. You will need to repair and rebuild your strike cruiser in order to successfully fight through the campaign, because even Grey Knights aren't invincible. Throughout the game, you'll interact with your three primary support staff, Brother Ekdar the Purifier, Inquisitor Kartha Vakir, and Dominus Lynette. They're the primary means through which the story progresses, and each of them are fun representations of different archetypes within the 40k universe, which unfortunately includes them being at each other's throats, with you having to defuse the situations. Uh, this, unfortunately, is inevitably making someone so unhappy that they'll just simply stop helping you for a month, regardless of how much you need them. So, I mean, again, 40k. And just in case that wasn't enough, you also have to contend with a rather grumpy Grey Knight Chapter Master, who will sometimes help you, but most likely will hinder your progress because Mercury is in retrograde and his bionic eye is a little itchy that day. I don't know, I never quite understood that, but hey, you know what? It's fun. So we've touched on the background of the game, and some of the storyline as well. Let's get into the gameplay, because this is by far the most important part. If I'm planning on investing 40, 50, 60, or even more hours into a game, it needs to be enjoyable to play. Otherwise, I'd rather just watch the story on YouTube and, you know, enjoy it that way. Chaos Gate is a turn-based strategy game that, in many ways, should remind you of XCOM or Phoenix Point, or any game like that. You send teams of four, and sometimes a dreadnought, highly customizable Grey Knights or Assassins to complete various types of missions throughout the map. You start with a small contingent of Grey Knights, and each of these Knights has a unique trait and is assigned a unique class that will dictate how they can be built up as they level and improve their skills. They can be injured or killed, taking them out of commission for future missions, which also forces you to recruit more Knights in order to combat the growing threat. This isn't as intense as XCOM, where any injury essentially takes them out for a long period of time, but it still is very important to the game. There are four primary classes and four advanced classes, which are unlocked later in the game. Each of these provides unique traits and abilities, unlocking a huge number of combinations and synergies that can be brought to bear against the demonic host. When you include the DLC into the mix, the number of classes is brought up to 12 with the addition of four unique assassin classes from the distinct assassin schools of the Officio Assassinorum. You can also utilize a Grey Knight Dreadnought in certain missions, as well as a Tech Marine, allowing for even more tactical specialization. Units have action points, which they can spend on movements, abilities, and combat, and each of the moves that your units make is a unique and powerful representation of what they're doing on the battlefield. Each knight can be equipped with different weapons, armor, and accessories, which allow them to specialize in certain playstyles, such as pure damage, critical hits, or stun-based builds, just to name a couple. In addition, their abilities range from simple effects such as increasing armor or damage to game-changing abilities that explode literally every demon in a five-mile radius. Okay, maybe, maybe not that insane, but Fury of the Ancients is amazing. Seriously. That's your judgment. These abilities all utilize a resource called Willpower which is a measure of each knight's capability to manifest warp powers. I don't really need to go into the lore detail of that, just 
assume it's a it's a resource that your knights use and you can gain it back etc etc so that amount of willpower per knight can be increased through leveling up or equipping specific gear and it can be recovered by killing enemies and a couple of other mechanics which we'll touch on later on called stratagems or through research that turns warp surges into beneficial events standard combat in demon hunters is unique amongst most games in the genre because every unit has a 100% chance to hit their target. XCOM, you have a 95% chance at most to hit something even if you're right next to it. In this game, it is 100% chance. Cover can be used to reduce or negate the damage entirely, but if your knights are out in the open, they may be in for a world of hurt because everyone can hit them. I personally really enjoy this type of combat as it makes things far more predictable and prevents like 10 turns of careful planning just from going up in smoke because of a missed 95% shot that leads to an entire squad wipe as the, you know, big bad of the mission didn't get killed. Weapons take the form of both ranged and melee, with ranged weapons having two stages. The first stage is half of the weapon's total range, and that means that the target will take full damage. Beyond the halfway point and up to the maximum range, the unit takes a reduced amount of damage. These ranges affect both you and your opponent, so careful unit placement can make the difference between survival and another dead knight in the stasis pods. Melee weapons, on the other hand, do a flat amount of damage, but must be used in close range. Both types of weapons can achieve critical hits, which increase the damage, but melee weapons almost always allow you to permanently weaken an enemy units, while ranged units have to rely on certain skills and abilities in order to accomplish that. And let's also touch on the warp surge meter for a moment. This is a representation of the power of the warp inside your current mission. When it fills to 100%, new modifiers are added to the mission, which are always negative for your team. They can be simple as removing one maximum HP from your knights, which isn't that much of a big deal unless you're already very, very low, or it can be as game-changing as giving all enemies armor piercing, which late in the game when you're using knights that have 15 plus armor can be an absolute terror to deal with. Because all of your knight's psychic abilities also contribute to the warp surge meter, it does force a balancing act between using extremely powerful abilities and limiting the damage that warp surges can actually do to you. Lastly, let's talk about stratagems and research. Research technically occurs outside of combat, but has tremendous impact throughout the game, including combat. As you fight the teeming masses of Nurgle, you will inevitably collect bloom seeds. These seeds come in different colors and represent different insidious forms of the Plague God. You spend these Bloom Seeds with Inquisitor Vakir in order to complete research, which progresses the story, unlocks new stratagems, upgrades your weapons, and provides passive benefits to your knights throughout the campaign. Stratagems are limited use abilities that can be used on your strike squad to change the battlefield in a huge way. You can teleport your entire squad, drop an orbital laser on cultists, or even make your squad immune to all debuffs for several turns. These stratagems are another unique feature of Demon Hunters, and one that I particularly enjoy. Outside of combat, you'll be moving around the sector in the Baleful Edict, spending servitors to upgrade and repair the ship, while searching for and moving to different missions. These missions generally spawn in clusters of three or more at a time, which simultaneously provide different rewards, but force you to make sacrifices in terms of what rewards you actually can get to and which planets grow more infested with the bloom. The key point in this is that they're time limited and they are designed so that you can't reach every mission, even with a completely upgraded ship. The mission type depends on the level of chaos corruption on the given planet, not including some story missions, which have very, very unique characteristics, with higher corruption corresponding to more mutations on the enemy as well as more warp surge being added to the meter per turn. The design here provides some consistent pressure and really did keep me on my toes for the entire campaign, making me consider the pros and cons of each mission, often leaving me to feel like I was dooming an entire planet simply out of necessity because I had to triage the planets that I could help and the rewards that I wanted. It's an unfortunate thing, but very, very interesting. Fortunately, all missions do involve dispensing the Emperor's judgment with extreme prejudice to cultists, Death Guard Marines, Chaos Demons, and even Armature Class Titans in the later portion of the game. Enemies spawn in roaming pods throughout the mission as well as through warp rifts as reinforcement. 
They scale throughout the game thanks to their unique chaos mutations as well as sheer numbers, and I was encountering new enemies all the way up until the end of the campaign. At the end of each mission, you have the chance to spend Requisition, one of the game's key currencies, in order to acquire new equipment or recruits. The quality of these can be upgraded throughout the game and can lead to some very interesting design decisions as far as which missions are chosen. There are many more small things that I could talk about including the other types of currencies, different abilities, squad makeups, and so on. But I believe I've really covered some of the most important points and if you don't enjoy the big points, the little points really aren't going to change your mind. So at this point, I'd like to condense my thoughts on the game and give you kind of a, a general pros and cons list from my perspective. Let me start by saying that I believe Demon Hunters is a great game. It combines a universe that I love with a genre that I really enjoy, while doing its best to respect both the time and investment that I've put into the game. The most important thing in a game like this for me is the combat, which I've mentioned before. I'm less interested in how it looks, you know, see for example Xenonauts 2, and more interested in whether or not it's interesting to play. However, in this case, Demon Hunters actually has both. The combat feels visceral, and every weapon your battle brothers wield sounds terrifying and brutal. The slow motion cutscene combat actions add to the visual flair, and sometimes it's just downright fun to watch your battle brother turn a chaos cultist into a paste with an auto cannon. Each class in Demon Hunters is unique, and while there are some shared specializations between the classes, each one is sufficiently different that I was able to use all eight base classes, plus the assassins and the additional DLC classes in various synergies, and I barely scratched the surface. In addition, the level up system in the game is incredibly impactful and doesn't leave you scratching your head or feeling like the level ups that they got were almost cosmetic, you know, plus one accuracy, plus one strength. In this case, you get direct and responsive feedback. Apart from the combat, the campaign is well designed and I feel like I never truly got bored throughout my 600 day playthrough. The constant threat of chaos corruption was excellent and it was easier for me to comprehend how each planet was actively affecting the campaign. When you compare that to a simple counter, it's just night and day, even though the Morbus counter does exist in this game. I also appreciate the simplicity. Now, I say simplicity, and this is in comparison to things like XCOM 2's Long War Mod, which can be incredibly complex, and I do like that as well. But honestly, not every game needs to have more working parts than Europa Universalis, and I appreciate that the developers took the opportunity to take that simplicity and warp the basic mechanics to create a new and ever-changing experience. And yes, that was totally pun intended, I'm sorry, but you watched it, and now you will never unhear it. Also, one last note, do yourself a favor and listen to the original soundtrack. That thing is phenomenal, and I love the ambiance it gave to every mission. Just as a heads up, the entire background audio for this video comes from the OST. So really though, give it a shot. Now, for all the praise I've heaped on the game, I'm not immune to the idea that it's flawed, and I would certainly agree with you if you think that it is. I have several small gripes, which I'm not really going to touch on, but I think there are two major issues and two moderate issues that I really want to get out there. First is the DLC. My feelings on the DLC aren't really related to the latest Execution Force offering, as I sincerely enjoyed that and I felt that it really added a lot to the base game. No, no, no. What I actually have a problem with is the Duty Eternal DLC. It currently sits at, well, at the time that I looked at it, a 39% positive review score. At that score, the Duty Eternal DLC is one of the most imbalanced DLCs I've seen in quite a long time. And I know I'm not the only one that feels this just from looking at the reviews alone. I won't go on a total rant here, but let me boil it down to the basics. This DLC forces players to deal with enemies far above their current power level when introduced. Archaeotech missions, when encountered late in the game, are just like any other, and they're quite fun. But in the first 200 days, they could easily wipe entire squads. In addition, the fancy dreadnought they offer you not only can't be used in regular missions, but any, and I mean any, damage that takes outside of its armor results in a significant servitor requirement in order to repair it back to full strength. This is just terrible for game balance as servitors are required to upgrade and repair anything on the edict. 
The missions themselves, when seen at the appropriate time period, are interesting, and the new Tech Marine class is unique, but not decisive enough to redeem the DLC. In my personal opinion, I like to run with the DLC off, but it does get easier as the campaign goes on, and there are some pretty cool impacts that, uh, that it can have on the campaign. The second major gripe I have with the campaign is the mission design. At the end of the day, every mission kind of dissolves into spawn at point A, move to objective at point B, then kill thing. And the only exception to this are the quest missions. That said, I, I will admit that the quest missions are very interesting and do a lot to spice up the game. This is less of an issue than the first, and even after my comments, I still enjoy the gameplay enough that the missions were basically the plate on which I was served an excellent Warhammer experience, if you want to put it that way. Now the two lesser issues I want to bring up. First is the commuting system. This, in my opinion only, was horribly explained and implemented even worse. Now when a battle brother dies in the field, they'll be transferred to the stasis pods of the Baleful Edict, assuming you've prepared them. From there, you can commune with them, providing additional skill points to your living battle brothers based on the level of your fallen knight. This literally incentivizes you to kill your Grey Knights in order to maximize your skills on a single Grey Knight and make them more powerful. In my YouTube playthrough, I didn't use it a single time. I think it's counterintuitive, contrary to lore, in the sense that you're trying to sacrifice your battle brothers, and just seems to be an afterthought in the design strategy. That leads us to my final issue, which was the pacing and resource management. I get this game is designed to be difficult and force you to efficiently use your resources, but sometimes it felt like I got so few resources, I wasn't even able to use them efficiently. Towards the end of my playthrough, I had only unlocked tier 2 out of 3 of the Baleful Edict, and 90% of all of my resources, primarily servitors in this case, were going to things that needed to be repaired due to random events, map incursions, or warp storms, which I just had no chance of getting around. Combine that with the cost of repairing a dreadnought, and oftentimes the only viable missions were those with servitor rewards, regardless of what other rewards they offered, be that well, you know, provisioned gear or high levels of requisition, etc, etc. Warhammer 40,000 Chaos Gate Demon Hunters is not a perfect game. However, it is pretty darn fun, and I would recommend it to anyone who enjoys games of strategy or the Warhammer 40,000 universe. If you like both, you probably already have this game, and you don't need me to say anything. But the well-designed combat and engaging story carry this game very far, and I believe that it deserves a spot alongside games like XCOM 2. One of the things that drew me to this game over similar titles is that the game really feels like you're taking charge of Grey Knights, pinnacles of war and indomitable even unto death. There's no panic in a Grey Knight about to die. Even with 1 HP left and surrounded by demons, you'll hear your knight spout off voice lines like, Only in death does duty end. Similarly, the Death Guard are pustulant and disgusting, with voices and voice lines to match. There's so much atmosphere in this game, it's easy to get lost in it, and you don't even need to know 40k to enjoy it, either. But what do you think? I'm only a sample size of one, and that's not a lot. Let me know in the comments below how you feel about the game, and whether or not you've played it through. For everyone here at the end, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. This is my first jump into heavily edited content, so I'm using this as an opportunity to learn and improve everything I'm doing. If you have any comments or criticisms, I'd love to hear it so that I can make things better the next time and continue to grow. Anyway, that's all from me guys. Hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.